Very good evening to all of you once again. I'm ever so thankful that you all can join me once again every time, every day. Thank you. We left off in 2 Samuel 18 with the death of King David's son, Absalom. He tried to take the throne from David. He is now dead after rebelling. We pick up with David grieving and grieving in a very prolonged, very hard manner. And, and you know, it's, in some ways you can't blame him for this grief, but he is really, really letting his emotions overcome him. And it was told, Joab, behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. <clears throat> In my honest opinion, I believe that this is a, a far deeper grief than that of simply losing a son, even though that's tragic in, in, in itself. There are those times whenever life itself is so, it's just so heavy that one can't help but let go of those repressed emotions of uh, despair. At this point in his life, David has actually been king and royalty longer than he ever was a normal citizen. He has, he's older now. He's lived through a lot more sorrows than he ever did before. He is suddenly dethroned. He has lost more than one son. He's lost several sons. And, um, he is at the end of his life. He's fleeing for his life. He's a fugitive, or he was just come out of being a fugitive, just lost his throne. He, he, he fled for not only his life, but for his family's life, his friend's life, or lives. And he sees his other friends turning against him. And plus one must remember the curse that, he had that was revealed to him after the Uriah and Bathsheba controversy. I mean, it's just all piled up on David. No doubt the man shed so many tears. And I think that this is an outpouring of not only the, uh, the death of Absalom, but I think it's just that old man at the end of his life. He's just seen enough. There just comes a point where you just know Heaven has got to be better than this. There's no, there's no more desire to stay on the earth for men in David's spot. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people. For the people heard say that day how the king was grieved for his son. And the people got them by stealth that day into the city as people being ashamed still away when they flee in battle. This is talking about whenever it says the people, it's also including, it's not just including the army. It's also including the, their families, their children, and it's no longer a great victory to them. This is not talking about Israel. This is talking about David's followers, his supporters, and they, he turns this day of victory into a horrendous day, gloomy day of mourning. But the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, Oh, my son Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. I mean, you can just hear it just from reading the words. You can just see the pain. And Joab came into the house to the king and said, Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved thy life, and the lives of thy sons, and thy daughters, and the lives of thy wives, and the lives of thy concubines. This is Joab, his nephew, the chief commander of his army for this moment anyway we'll see that change up a little bit during this study but this is him slapping david with some harsh reality harsh truths and he's saying you are you would rather us have died than absalom and that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. For thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. I mean, just imagine the setting of this. The people are outside. The king, he's been in there for hours now. And you hear him mourning out of the, whatever, the window or whatever there was 
you hear the king mourning, yelling, crying like a like a man in the streets, you know, like it would have just been a very disturbing thing to hear. This is supposed to be the man of God that leads you. And instead he's broken and everyone sees how broken that he is for his greatest enemy, no doubt. Now, therefore, arise, go forth and speak comfortably unto thy servants. For I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night, and that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from thy youth until now. Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told unto all the people, saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate, and all the people came before the king, for Israel had fled every man to his tent. The gate was a place of authority. And all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king saved us out of the hand of our enemies, and he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines, and now he has fled out of the land for Absalom. This is Israel talking. And Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now therefore, why speak ye not a word of bringing the king back? So they're talking about wanting David back, because now they see that Absalom, the one that they had chosen over him, is dead. And they're saying, oops, made the wrong choice. Now the king is still alive, you know, and the one that they trusted is now dead. Proverbs 18.3 states this, When the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt. Catch that also on in there. Also contempt and with ignominy reproach. This is, this is a verse to take to heart, for all of us to take to heart, Any anyone throughout all creation should take this to heart when the wicked cometh then cometh also contempt no man whenever you see them woman child none of them come alone you may only see them alone but really they're bringing either blessings or cursing they're bringing contempt ignominy reproach they're bringing all of these or they're bringing joy laughter goodness no man comes by himself. So many believe that whenever Barack Obama came along, they were calling him. Jamie Foxx called him the his Lord and Savior, and they had thought that he would heal all the nations, not just America. The whole world cried about and tumbled over for this fool, if you ask me. They thought that he would solve the entire world's problems. What did Obama do? What did Obama bring with him? Well, he still made it the economy. The economy was already, he inherited a bad economy, granted, but it got very, very little better during his presidential time. He gave our money, Americans' money, to terrorists. His very last act, one of his very last acts, was to send hundreds of billions of dollars to Iran. Donald Trump stopped that. He legalized gay marriage. He fully funded Planned Parenthood. He started the Common Core Education Program, this new system that they have, which is totally absurd. He introduced a failed health care plan or policy law, whatever you wish to say, with Obamacare. That, that tanked completely. There's also the matter of the Fast and Furious scandal where he, they found out that Barack Obama had his hands bloodied with shipping our guns down to into Mexico and such. A completely failed president, a failed presidency under Barack Obama. Yet everybody thought he was going to just bring change and he got reelected. Absalom is the same. He's, he was the same way. They thought that Absalom would bring change. We need to get rid of this, you know, this great king, David. And we need something new, something different. We want something, you know, let's shake up the cage a little bit. And so they put Absalom on in there. And what did Absalom do? Everything pretty terrible for the very short time that he was king. Everything terrible. And wound up dead. Every man brings something to the table. There's baggage with everyone. And we see now that they have learned in Israel during this study 
the error of their ways, they're starting to say, "Uh uh-oh. And King David sent to Zedek and to Abiathar the priest, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, Why are ye the last to bring the king back to his house, seeing the speech of all Israel was come to the king, even to his house? Now these are the elders of Judah, not the elders of Israel. This is his own people, the first people that actually made David a king in Hebron that he's wanting to address. Why have you not come? And supported me. Why are you not trying to bring me back to Jerusalem? Ye are my brethren. Ye are my bones and my flesh. Wherefore then are ye the last to bring back the king? And say ye to Amasa, Art thou not of my bone and of my flesh? God do so to me. And more also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Jacob. Or jo- uh, Joab. Oh, well, now, what he's doing right here is he's he's replacing Joab. And it may have been because Joab was older, and this was also a a reconciliation kind of move. Amasa was the chief commander of Absalom's army, and he was also cousin to Joab. I don't think that Joab really would have um, fought against this too much. Some of the comments said that they believed that Joab was being replaced because of Maybe a little bit of a dispute between he and David. He and David seem to have had a bit of a rocky relationship. But it seemed stable enough to keep the army together. But Joab was the man that everyone would follow, no matter what. As well as David, of course. But now we're seeing Amasa, who was just defeated by Joab in battle we're seeing him taking joab's place this is not getting rid of joab this is simply kind of a demotion joab is under his brother abishai at this time and he bowed the heart of all the men of judah even as the heart of one man so that they sent this word unto the king return thou and all thy servants so the priests went up they speak to the elders of judah and they say bring him back So the king returned and came to Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king to conduct the king over Jordan. So this, they would have come right here. David is about to cross over the Jordan, and Judah comes up to meet him at Gilgal, which is pretty much right above Jericho. And Shammai, the son of Gera, Benjamite, which was of Bahram, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. Remember, Shammai is the one that insulted David whenever he was first leaving Jerusalem, fleeing from Absalom. Remember, he was throwing rocks at him and cursing him, and he kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. He followed him doing this. So Shammai is repentant, and he runs up to David. He's one of the first men that actually see David once that he's um, at the Jordan. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba the servant of the house of Saul, and his six and his fifteen sons, and his twenty servants with him, and they went over Jordan before the king. Now what this is is like an escort service. It's like it's kind of ceremonial if you want to look at it in that way. They're wanting to make a very grand re entrance for David. It's a way of showing him love. And there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And Shammai, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan. And said unto the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity unto me. Neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that my lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. For thy servant doth know that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I am come the first this day of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai the son of Zeruiah answered and said, Shall not Shammai be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? Abishai, David's nephew, one uh, the uh, one of the great captains of his army, um, He wanted, Abishai actually wanted to kill Shammai before, whenever he was throwing the rocks at David. Abishai said, let me cut off his head. Abishai, one of these very scary men that could have easily have done it. One of these mighty men of war. And David spared him then, and David spares him now. 
And David said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruiah, that ye should this day be adversaries unto me? Shall there any man be put to death this day in Israel? For do not I know that I am this day king over Israel? He says, I'm secure in my position. There's nothing that he can do to me. Why, why kill him? It's a happy day. You know, he just got over this grieving. He, does, he doesn't want to see bloodshed. Charles Spurgeon, he had really good comment on this. He says, Perhaps you have been like Shemaiah. And you are afraid that Jesus will never forgive you. But David forgave Shammah, and Jesus is ready to forgive you. He delighteth in mercy. I do believe, listen to what he says, I do believe that the harps of heaven never give to Christ such happiness as he has when he forgives the ungodly, and saith, Thy sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Therefore the king said unto Shammah, Thou shalt not die, and the king sware unto him. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and had neither dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. Now remember, Ziba, the man that came up with Shemaiah, was also the man in whom was to take care of Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, who was crippled. And all of the land that Saul had, King Saul had, David allotted to Mephibosheth. He says, here, you can have all the land, but Ziba is going to help you take care of it. Whenever David was fleeing Jerusalem, Ziba comes up with supplies and food and raiment and all of this for David and his men. He comes up seemingly a very generous offer, and Ziba says, oh, Mephibosheth has turned against you. He wishes to profit from the controversy between you and Absalom. He almost wants his kingdom back that Saul, his grandfather, had. He says, now the Lord will give unto me, because Absalom and David are bickering now. Now the kingdom will be torn apart, and I'll get my rightful inheritance. That's what Ziba said about Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son. Now we're about to learn the truth. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? He says, Why didn't you go with me? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass, that I may ride thereon, and go to the king, because thy servant is lame. See, Ziba, as depicted in the middle right here, Ziba, he took the ride, the mule, from Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was going to come and, and see David. And he hath slandered thy servant unto my lord the king. But my lord the king is as an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. He's saying, you know me, David. You know, but if you wish to do me harm for what Ziba lied about me, saying that I'm glad that you fled and that Absalom. He says, if you think that I thought that about you, then do so what is good to you. For all of my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king. Yet didst thou set my servant among them, thy servant among them, talking about himself. Yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table. What right therefore have I yet to cry any more unto the king? I really like what he says right here real quick. He's saying, I had nothing before you blessed me, David. He says, and if you wish to take all of that away now, I'm, I'm happy that I had something. And the king said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of thy matters? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the land. Okay, so what David is doing now is he says, Well, now you and Ziba both part the land. That way they'll be, and I believe that that's a way of David saying, Don't bicker anymore. Obviously, Ziba is wanting some of Saul's land. So here's some of the land for Ziba, and here's some of the land for you. That way you don't have to see him anymore. You don't have to bicker among one another. Everything will be fine. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord the king has come again in peace unto his own house. Whenever Ziba lied initially about Mephibosheth's plot against David, David became angry, and he acted in haste. And he says, everything that's Mephibosheth, Ziba, he says, is now yours. Now he's telling them, divide the land. Now Mephibosheth is saying, let him have all of it. It, uh, it doesn't matter to me. He says, as long as you're safe. And that kind of has a feel of what Solomon says to the woman 
you know, the two women bickering over the one child to, in order to figure out who was the true mother. Solomon says, well, we're going to cut the baby in half, divide the baby. And the real mother said, well, just let her have all of it. She loved the baby more than she loved her own gain from it, her own personal gain, her own self. And Mephibosheth is showing that same kind of heart. He says, let him have all the land. I don't even care about it. And Barzillai, the Gileadite, came down from Rogalim and went over Jordan with the king to conduct him over Jordan. Barzillai is the man in whom helped David and the men so greatly. He's a man of great, great wealth, but he's also in his 80s. Now, Barzillai was a very aged man, even fourscore years old, and he had provided the king of sustenance while he lay at Mahanaim, for he was a very great man. And the king said unto Barzillai, Come thou over with me, and I will feed thee with me in Jerusalem. And Barzillai said unto the king, How long have I to live, that I should go up with the king into Jerusalem? I am this day fourscore years old, and can I discern between good and evil? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto my lord the king? Thy servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king, and why should the king recompense it me with such a reward? Let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again, that I may die in mine own city, and be buried by the grave of my father and of my mother. But behold thy servant, Kimham, let him go over with my lord, the king, and do to him what shall seem good unto thee. So after all that he has done for David, he wishes no reward in return. Barzillai is the exact opposite of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 that Jesus tells us about. This rich man, he had all kinds of goods, all kinds of food, and there was a poor man that sat outside of his gate, and it says that he waited for the crumbs. He just desired the crumbs from the king's table, and basically in our modern vernacular, that's like the trash. He would go through like the trash of, of this rich man, like a homeless man would today. Well, this rich man never would help Lazarus. As a matter of fact, there were dogs that come up and try to help Lazarus more than this rich man. And that tells you something. I believe that, I believe that, that says even dogs are better than men like this. And we see right here with Barzillai, he doesn't wish anything. He, he gave it all out of the goodness of his heart. And by the way, it was far, far worse. A lot of people would say, well, he's giving it to King David. He's not giving it to a homeless man. No, he's, he's, it's not King David when he was feeding him. It was fugitive David. Barzillai could be put to death for giving any crumbs to David. Yet he gave a whole lot of them. The rich man never gave anything to Lazarus. He, there was no threat to his life. And he's still just so pompous that he didn't want to give anything. But he is sending Kimham over to with David. Now, this is his son. We, uh, we learn more about that. One of the last requests of David to, um, or command rather, to Solomon Bef right before his death is to treat the sons of Barzillai well. He says, make sure that you do well by them because of how good Barzillai was to me. And the king answered, Kimham shall go over with me and I will do to him that which shall seem good unto thee. And whatsoever thou shalt require of me, that will I do for thee. And all the people went over Jordan. And when the king was come over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him. And he returned into his own place. Then the king went on to Gilgal, and Kimham went on with him, and all the people of Judah conducted the king, and also half the people of Israel. And behold, all the men of Israel came to the king, and said unto the king, Why have our brethren the men of Judah stolen thee away, and have brought the king and his household, and all David's men with him over Jordan? And all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is near of kin to us. Wherefore then be ye angry for this matter? Have we eaten at all of the king's cost, or hath he given us any gift? You see, now these are the tribes bickering. This is the genesis, if you will, of 
these this separation from these tribes we'll see it far more prevalent in the days of david's grandson rehoboam and the men of israel answered the men of judah and said we have ten parts in the king meaning we are ten tribes we share and with him just as much see because david is from the tribe of judah so judah says he's one of ours and uh, and israel these ten tribes but these ten tribes say wait a minute they say we have ten parts with him and then they go on to say, And we have also more right in David than thee. Why then did ye despise us, that our advice should not be first had in bringing back our king? And the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. So they're getting into it. Who should honor David more? Okay, now we're coming upon chapter 20. This is a relatively short chapter, but it's got a whole lot in it. This chapter is the summation of David's life. It tells about the last great event in David's life, or at least the most noteworthy outside of it. And there happened to be there a man of Bilal, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tents, O Israel. So this man, Sheba, is, he's standing up for the tribe of Benjamin, and he says, we have no inheritance in him. See, Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin. But notice the kind of rhetoric that Sheba uses. He says, we have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Anytime that someone referred to David as, uh, or at least most of the time, whenever they referred to David as the son of Jesse and not the king of Israel, then it was a slot at at uh, at David. It was a way to devalue David in a way, take away his royalty. Because Jesse, his father, was a humble farmer. That's all that he was. Now that's an important position to have in the community. You don't eat without farming, but it wasn't like being a king. Saul actually referred to David as the son of Jesse. But whenever he wanted to, you know, get in David's good graces again, he would call him his son. You're my son, the son of the royal house. Donald Trump is one of the master <laughs> players at this kind of rhetoric. He, he actually, uh, he knows how to do this. Uh, you tack on titles to people that you don't like. In order to set something in your mind, some kind of agenda, some kind of, um, you want to spoil any kind of valor of the person. It's like with Hillary Clinton, what does Trump call her? He calls her Crooked Hillary. With Joe, he calls Joe Biden Crazy Joe. He calls um, uh, CNN, all of the media, he calls them fake news. So that every time that his supporters think about who they're watching, even the people that like CNN will have it in the back of their mind, fake news, fake news, fake news. It's a brilliant tactic, and they've actually written books on that kind of strategy that Donald Trump uses. It's a, it's a very effective one, and we see Sheba doing it right here. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba the son of Bichri, but the men of Judah clave unto their king from Jordan even to Jerusalem. Now Judah is also the tribe of which Jesus would come out of. And they're the that's where we get the name Jew now. That's why we call them Jews. It's because of the tribe of Judah. They were the only tribe that actually they stuck to the traditions that had been established way, way before them, hundreds of years before them. The tribe of Judah was the most loyal of all of Israel. The rest of them, they went about to other nations. They're the ones that scattered that we hear about. And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the, the house, and put them in ward, and fed them, but went not in unto them. So they were shut up unto the day of their death, living in widowhood. Remember how Absalom went in, he laid with these ten concubines. Well, now David is putting them away for very good reason. Uh, there's uh, several reasons. He will not go in and have sex with them anymore. He puts them away instead of letting them go and free to marry others, which a lot of people would say that's the that's the that's the most merciful thing to do, really. But no, he takes them and he he 
pretty much just puts them away in the palace. He doesn't allow them to marry. They have to be widows for the rest of their life now. Because of what Absalom did. And really because of his sin way before them. You know, uh, it's because of what David did to Uriah. All of this is remaining with David through every moment of his life. This curse is just plaguing him. He doesn't get away with it in any way. It's a very evil act. But anyway, he puts them away because if he does allow them to go free and let them marry, then there's a poss there's the possibility of another uprising. Someone else can claim a connection to the throne. Another man can marry one of these concubines that were that was one of David's and claim a little bit of a uh, right to the throne. Then said the king to Amasa, Assemble me, the men of Judah, within three days, and be thou here present. Now remember, he has made Amasa the new Joab, and he has demoted Joab. Could have been for personal reasons, I don't know, but he sets Amasa up as his chief commander chief general now over his armies and he gives him this he says now go and gather up all the men of judah because we're going to go fight sheba he's not going to make the same mistake that absalom made with him and linger on this he's not going to take a long time he knows you've got to attack quickly so amasa went to assemble the men of judah but he tarried longer than the set time which he had appointed him and David said to Abishai, Now shall Sheba, the son of Bichri, do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou thy lord's servants, and pursue after him, lest he get him fenced cities and escape us. And there went out after him Joab's men, and the Carathites, and the Pelathites, and all the mighty men, and they went out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. Now remember, Joab is not kicked out of the army. He's still a commander within the army. When they were at the great stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa went before them, and Joab's garment that he had put on was girded unto him, and upon it a girdle with a sword fastened upon his loins and the sheath thereof, and as he went forth it fell out. And Joab sees Amasa coming, because Amasa's still wanting to fight in David's army. He just, he shouldn't be the leader of it. And Joab sees him being Joab. And Joab said to Amasa, Art thou in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with the right hand to kiss him. Now this was a, a the custom back then. It was a way of showing great friendship. It's kind of like how we shake hands today or, you know, just give one another a hug or something. But it's also so he could catch Amasa. And it doesn't necessarily mean that he grabbed him by the bottom of the beard. It could have been just by the cheek. He could have just kind of reached on out. And it was, it, it was a way of relaxing Amasa. It was a friendly gesture. But it was also a way of grabbing him with that hawk-like grip that Joab no doubt had and holding him while he stabbed him. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand, so he smote him therewith in the fifth rib and shed out his bowels to the ground and, and struck him not again, and he died. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued after Sheba, the son of Bichra. I've actually heard that's one of the most painful ways to die. He got stabbed in the stomach. That's a very long, drawn-out death. Very painful. And it even says how his insides kind of came out, so you get this feeling that he was just completely gutted. And one of Joab's men, and Joab, and Joab knows how to kill men like that. I think that he did it out of a little bit of jealousy, you know, you take my position. And now Joab has come back into his old, his prior position as the chief commander. And one of Joab's men stood by him and said, He that favoreth Joab and he that is for David, let him go after Joab. And Amasa wallowed in blood in the midst of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he removed Amasa out of the highway into the field and cast a cloth upon him when he saw that everyone that came by him stood still. Now what this says, the Bible does say this a couple of different instances, but it says that whenever the men saw him, they came by him and stood still, meaning that they were shocked. It was such a gruesome scene. They were actually, they, were, they stood and just, they were petrified for a moment at what Joab had done to Amasa. So they cover him up and they throw him off the road. When he was removed out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichra. 
And he went through all the tribes of Israel unto Abel and to Beth Maka, and all the Barites, and they were gathered together and went also after him. So right down here is Jerusalem. This is where David's at. This is where Joab and Abishai come from. They work their way up. They go past Samaria. Sheba has fled all the way up here to Abel. And they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Malacca. And they cast up a bank against the city. And it stood in the trench. And all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. A besiegement was very, very harsh. It meant, at the very, very least, starvation for the people inside. They wouldn't allow supplies to get in, however much that you had. And that's for a prolonged besiegement. Most times they wouldn't do that. They would just go up and they would try to batter down the walls. And that's what Joab and them are doing right now. Then cried a wise woman out of the city. Here, here, say I pray you unto Joab, come near hither that I may speak with thee. So this woman, you get the phone that she's on top of the wall. And they knew the dire consequences of this besiegement. They didn't want this to, to be drawn out. It was terrifying to be besieged. If you've ever watched Lord of the Rings, the two towers, then you get a little bit about what a besiegement kind of is like. But this woman, she wants no part of it. She's a wise woman as well. And when he was come near unto her, the woman said, Art thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then she said unto him, Hear the words of thine handmaid. And he answered, I do hear. This woman's probably got family on the inside of the walls she's wanting to take care of. Then she spake, saying, They were wont to speak in old time. Now listen to this. They were wont to speak in old time, saying, They shall surely ask counsel at a bell. And so they ended the matter meaning that people would gather inside of this city and they would converse and that's how they settled their disputes. She's saying, she's hinting around like, that's how we're going to settle this dispute. You're not going to batter down our walls. <laughs> we're going to talk about this. What's going on? I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why wilt thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered and said, Far be it, far be it from me, that I should swallow up or destroy. Now this is one of the last great events of David's reign right here. This is the conclusion of the matter anyway. It's coming to a quick end. The matter is not so, Joab said, but a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba the son of Bichri by name, hath lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said unto Joab, these are very tough words. And the woman said unto Joab, behold, his head shall be thrown to thee over the wall. <laughs> now that's a way to settle a matter right there. She says, just give me a second. <laughs> Guys, come here. <laughs> you know, it's very tough, tough um, uh, statement right there. Very bold. Then the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba the son of Bichri, and cast it out to Joab. And he blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city, every man to his tent, and Joab returned to Jerusalem and to the king. Sheba, I'm guessing, he thought that he was very secure behind these high walls. Probably thought, well, no one can touch me. You know, I got plenty of time on in here. Everything will be all right. I've, I've got some men that support me and everything. I'll, I'll be just fine. I remember what David Wilkerson said about wicked men, you know, that go against God's plan. And he was also referring to backsliders as well. He said, you're, he said, you're dangerous men. You're, you're worse than dangerous men. He says, I don't even want to be around you because you are in a danger. You're on dangerous ground. Whenever you go against God, you're in, you're on dangerous territory. Every step you take, is just one step before hell. You know, it's Sheba thought that like all these atheists and all these agnostics, all these scoffers, they, they think that they're secure. I've still got breath in my lungs and a heartbeat and a family that supports me and loved ones and children. And God's not going to do anything to me. Even if there is a God, he's not going to send me to hell. I'm a good guy. Well, that's the way that they think. But really, they don't know God. And that's the whole problem. They use all of these I'm a good guy tactics as walls, like Sheba does, 
It's walls against the truth. Walls up, you know. There is no walls that can keep all of heaven away from you. It's one thing to be an enemy of God himself, like an atheist or an agnostic, whatever. It's one thing to be that. You can't fight God. There's no immediate reason that you absolutely need to be struck down at any moment. Because you can't attack God. It's inevitable that you'll die and be judged. So your earthly life can linger whenever you're an enemy of just God. But whenever you're an enemy of one of God's chosen men on earth, and you mean to do him harm and to thwart the will of God and the spreading of the gospel, whenever you do that and you pose such a great threat that Sheba did to David, then punishment is immediate. Death is certain, and it is right around the corner. You cannot... D David has very few days left to live anyway at this point. So punishment will be swift, and it is. The very people that he stood around with inside of the walls, God turned against him. That is just like... There's no escape. Joab didn't have to lift a single finger. Now a woman stands up and says... Just give us a second. <laughs> that always strikes me every time that I read that. Now, here's the last few verses of the chapter, and then we're coming to a close on today. This is the summation of David's reign and its fullness. We'll get into more details here tomorrow and such on what happened during his reign, like the famine, the uh, census, and all of these. But after all of this reign of King David... God decides to honor these men by mentioning them here at the end of chapter 20. Now, Joab was over all the hosts of Israel, and Benaiah, the son of Joadiah, was over the Carathites and over the Pelathites. And Adoram was over the tribute, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ehelud, was recorder. And Sheva was scribe, and Zadok and Abiathar were the priest. And Ira also, the Jairite, was a chief ruler about David. And that, my friends, is the reign of King David. We still have a few details to get to, him speaking to Solomon in the first two chapters of 1 Kings. We still have to talk about, as I said, the famine and the census. But that is it for the reign of David in the general form. We'll get into more specifics, though. I thank you all for listening. God, peace be with you all. Amen.